Hey there, everybody. I'm Jeff. This is Tabletop Toolbox on Remote, and you have tuned in to episode 12 of the weekly Ratchet. I'm vacationing at a cabin in the woods, and so let's answer that universal question. Does a board gamer play board games in the woods? I think you know the answer, but let's get to it anyways here on the weekly Ratchet. Hey there, everyone. That's right. I'll bet you were not expecting to hear from me this week. Well, hey, I could not pass up the opportunity to film in this beautiful location. I am here at a log cabin in the Shenandoah Valley. This is on the western edge of the Allegheny Mountains, and it is called the Torty Cabin. Now, this is the cabin that my family and I built over the past year, year and a half. Now, I say that we built it, we paid someone to build it, but I've done a lot of work in this cabin. It's called the Torty, and it's named after after a tortoiseshell cat that lived with us for many years. Her name was Maria. She had a lot of health issues, but she was a fantastic little kitty, and we decided to name our first cabin after our first cat. Uh, I'm here in the great room. It's a very echoey space, so you might notice I'm trying to keep my volume a little under control, and I'm hoping that it's not gonna be too bad. My apologies if the audio of this is just a little off. But this is our, our great room, a large space with cathedral ceilings and you'll even see some ornamental lighting that yours truly climbed up into the attic to install. No, that wasn't any fun whatsoever, but I love this place. Obviously, we have put a ton of work and blood, sweat and tears and money into this place and I just couldn't pass up the opportunity to, you know, spend some time here with my audience on the Weekly Ratchet. Anyways, what I want to start off this video with here, I don't have any new games to show you this week. Obviously, I've been preparing for this vacation that I'm spending here. So I wanted to show you the game library that we have here at the Torty. We have tried to kind of build an eclectic collection of games. Uh, the game wall is over here. You'll probably see it in one of my, my pass around videos uh, that I'll be posting. But we've got your typical stuff, right? We have Life. We have Sorry. We have, uh, what is that? I can't even read that from over here. Oh, Connect Four. It's upside down. That doesn't help us. Uh, we've got Life. We've got Blockus. We've got Twister, Upwards. We actually don't have Monopoly here. We figured we wanted people to come here and still like each other when they left. <laughs> but I do have some other games, some more kind of hobby-esque games and I want to show them to you just real quickly. I'm not going to run through all of these in any real detail but uh, but yeah these are some of the games that we have. So this is Anomia. This is a fantastic party game about trying to say something based on a clue. The cards will give you a clue. The first person to shout out the answer gets the point. There's a lot more to it. Like I said I'm not going to get into it but this is probably the game that I have laughed at more than any other game in my entire life. Fantastic game. Anomia. I uh, also have Exploding Kit. Uh, if you follow the channel here at all, you know that my daughter and wife and I really love this game. This is the party pack, so it plays up to 10 people, which is exactly how many people this cabin is built to sleep. Fun little fact. So that's Exploding Kittens. I also have Cat in the Box. Obviously, it's kind of a cat-themed place, and so this game made a lot of sense. I think it's fairly clear to tell that no one has actually tried to play this yet, as all the pieces are still very nice and neatly organized. Oh well, that is cat in the box. Up next, this is Lanterns, uh, the Harvest Festival. I actually think someone may have tried to play this. The box is just a little beat up. Uh, but this is a really neat sort of a tile laying game uh, where you're trying to collect sets of beautiful lanterns to then score points to impress the emperor. Pretty game. One of the oldest games that my uh, wife and I actually had played at a, ca a cafe down in Athens, Georgia. Next one is Project L. This is sort of a, I hate to say this, but it's a Tetris-y type, type of a game. You're filling in little puzzles with little pieces. Very colorful, pretty game. Uh, and I thought this would be a great uh, great game here for families to be able to play. This is Sugar Blast. <laughs> this is such a dumb game. Sugar Blast is kind of one of those, it's inspired by match three games like Candy Crush or Candy Rush, whatever the heck they're called. Uh, but it's actually not too bad. You have these little plastic pieces. Let me see if I can get this on camera here somewhat. You have these little plastic pieces representing pieces of candy. You're trying to match three and then you can actually shift the board uh, 
to you know, make the pieces sort of slide down just like in the video games. We played this maybe twice. It, it is a decent little game. It's very, very light, very quick, 20 minutes. I think it doesn't even play in that long. Um, but my wife decided to go ahead and bring it here to have in the cabin. I'm gonna come back to this one. This one is, ooh, I just dinged up that box. This is Summer Camp. This is a Phil Walker Harding game. It is a very light deck building game about going to a summer camp and you're trying to do various activities like kayaking, canoeing, uh, you know, swimming, archery, fire making, that kind of stuff. It's sort of a kind of a path racing game. You're moving across these three different paths related to the three activities that you choose. There's I think eight or, or 10 or so in the box. And you can pick three different activities that you're gonna engage with in the game. And you're basically just trying to move along this path, you know, sort of progressing in that, uh, in those themes. It's okay, it's a, it's a cute game. It's a little light, obviously, which makes sense, but a decent little deck builder and something that we thought would be nice to have here at the cabin. This is, <laughs> I love Meadow. This is uh, Meadow by Rebel Studio, uh, a just gorgeous game. I think one of the prettiest games. Of course, this I have a copy of this at home. Uh, I bought this just for the cabin, and I think I'm gonna play it tonight because it's also possibly my favorite solo game. And uh, yeah, I, I can't say enough great about Meadow. I have a review of it out on the Dice Tower. If you haven't heard of it, go check that out. Uh, second to last one here is your traditional Ticket to Ride. I thought, hey, this is the game that started my family down the path of hobby games. Why not have it here at the cabin? And maybe another family could take that same journey. So, gotta have Ticket to Ride. The last one I'll show you here real quick is Shadows in the Forest. This is the perfect Cabin in the Woods game, and here's why. Uh, I'll, I'll explain this one in just a little more detail. You have a lantern in this game, a little LED battery powered lantern. One person is the tracker, I believe it's called, and the other players, you can play this with really as many people as you want. I mean, six is kind of what it says. I believe it says it's up to six, two to seven, two to seven uh, players. And the other players are representing these shadowlings. You have these cardboard trees and, and boulders that kind of sit along the board and you're trying the, the tracker, I believe it's called the tracker, is trying to find the shadowlings and they find it by moving this lantern along these paths, these spaces, these kind of rock path spaces on the board. And uh, after they move, they look to see if the light from the lantern shines on any of these mysterious shadowling looking characters. And if they do, they catch the shadowling. The shadowling loses its little, a little white mask that it wears, a little piece of plastic that pops out of the out of the figure and then it's frozen it can't move and then they continue to try and capture the masks of all the shadowlings in play the more shadowlings that are in play the harder the game is for the tracker however once each shadowling has been caught it has to then fall back into the shadows and the other shadowlings have to then kind of rejoin with it to get its mask back on it and enable it to move again so there is a lot of you know it's a one versus many game there's a lot of sort of strategic play. There's a lot of, uh, I think there's a lot of above the table play. So when we play this, uh, my daughter loves being the tracker. And so my wife and I were, you know, controlling these shadowlings and we would do things like make other noises around the table so that she, you know, she, cause obviously the person playing the tracker can't watch you while the shadowlings are making their moves. And so we would make other move, other noises around the table to kind of try and, uh, to kind of try and distract my daughter from where, what we might actually be doing. Uh, it's a game you have to play. So the reason I say it's perfect to play in a cabin is cause you have to play this in the pitch dark. In fact, we play this only at night. We turn off every light in the cabin uh, and it gets really dark out here. It's probably safe to, to assume. And the little lantern does a phenomenal job, quite frankly, of shooting these shadows and these beams of light all across the board. It is a fantastic experience, I think, in this space. We've played it at this very table many times. Love Shadows in the Forest. Okay, hey, that's the game library here at the Torty. Glad I got to share that with some folks. Let's go ahead and jump to our next segment.
All right, here we go into the question of the week. Last week I asked you, how do you prefer to learn your board games? Do you like to watch videos or do you like to read rule books or is there some other method? And of course, of all the answers, those are pretty much the only two methods that came up. So let me get to the answers here real quick. First off, first time poster Omar Hernandez says that he prefers videos using the rule book as a supplement to what he's heard. And that makes perfect sense. And thanks for joining us, Omar. I know Omar from over on the Dice our channel. Glad to have you with us. Along his uh, comments, Dan Cheston also said that he likes to watch videos and use the rule book to clear up any questions. He also said that he has Matt Ball teach him heavier games to increase his odds of defeating him. Now, personally, Dan, I prefer to teach Matt Ball those heavier games and then just leave out the parts as to how you make points. That, you know, is what I've been leaning on. I'm not saying it's worked for me, but, you know, you can give it a shot. <laughs> Kay said that she too prefers to watch videos, but her son prefers to read the books. And that's that's great, Kay. I say, hey, keep them reading. Thanks for the comment. Cartoonist said that maybe it's because he's getting older, but he prefers to have the games taught to him and thus prefers videos, though he realizes that he should be familiar with rule books and probably needs to get back into the habit of reading them. And along those lines, Tony Lawhorn said that he leans towards the rule books, but appreciates a good video, mentioning heavy cardboard as a uh, channel that he frequents, which I must admit I've always struggled to learn from myself. Uh, Simulation Chris agreed that some rule books can be difficult to read, but tends to prioritize them over videos, most notably saying that he prefers to learn the game with its setup on the table in front of him. And you know, that's a pretty good idea. <laughs> I can't really say that I've ever thought about doing that myself, sort of setting up the game and then learning it. Uh, although there probably have been some instances where I've done that if the rules just aren't clicking for me. I may try to kind of set it up and walk through it a little bit. And also when you think about it, if you go to like a game event or you know maybe a con or something like that, you're probably gonna be taught the game with it set up on the table. And I feel like that tangible interaction with that element that you're trying to learn makes a lot of sense. So that's, that's a pretty good idea. CR Pohl said that he definitely prefers videos because, as he explains, rule books seem to be pretty bad, especially for folks who aren't as familiar with the vernacular used in gaming. And you know, I think that's another really good point, <clears throat> and I'm going to talk about that more here in just a moment. But one thing is, of course, yes, gaming terms when we talk about, uh, you know, advancing a track, or maybe we talk about, uh, you know, discarding cards, and some of those things that, you know, maybe we just kind of take for granted as being commonly accepted terms. And for some folks uh, who maybe aren't used to playing games that, that use those methods or those systems or those mechanisms may struggle a little bit to understand exactly what those mean. But there's another element to that I think that I've seen a bunch is that games that try to name everything, like this deck of cards is the, the treasure pile and they don't call it treasure deck right they just call it treasure and then this this deck of cards might be the outcomes and so it says well you know draw a treasure and then draw an outcome and determine if they coincide and you're like I don't know what what is treasure what are you talking about and you have to try and go all the way back to the setup and see well you know we'll shuffle these cards marked with this symbol and that's the treasure deck and you're like oh okay well, couldn't you just said draw a card from the treasure deck you know instead of trying to use some creative, you know, clever term, and all you're doing is making it harder to learn the game. So I can, I can understand with that as well. It's not just a vernacular thing. It's when games and designers and developers, whatever, try to go above and beyond to cutesy up the game when the rules really just need to teach you how to play it and then let players immerse themselves into the theme once they know how to play the game, right? So a couple things that I'll say here. Uh, and first of all, thank you so much for all the comments uh, and appreciate it as always. So as a reviewer and of course, you know, someone who does videos and also someone who is kind of commonly the teacher for my friends and family, I need to learn a lot of games. I learn a ton of games. I mentioned the bag of games in the corner. I think most of them in there I don't know how to play and I'm going to have to learn them here in the next like 48 hours. I'm a little anxious for it. Uh, so because of that, uh, I, what I tend to do oftentimes, I'll, I'll you know, kind of be going through my 
my stack. Okay, I need to work on these. And I'll grab a couple rule books. I'll take them back over to the main house. And, you know, as I mentioned, I, I film in the tree house, which is a detached building. And so I'll take things over to the main house. After dinner, I'll usually just plop down on my recliner. I usually get a cat on my shoulder and I just sit there and I read the rule book. It's not always the best way to go. And I'll usually spend a lot of time kind of flipping back and forth, maybe taking a little break, you know, going to go get a drink or something, come back and kind of keep reading. Sometimes I'll even take the rule books up to bed and kind of sit there and just continue to read it until I sort of zonk out. It helps me sleep for some of these rule books. Uh, I'm not saying I learned a whole bunch in that process, but you know, it helps me get a good night's sleep. Uh, and so because of that, I do tend to lean towards the rule books because I can kind of do it on my own time. I can kind of jump in and out of that. If I'm watching a video, I often feel like I have to focus on every single second of that video, especially if it is a good video, uh, then I, I, you know, I can't divert my attention and I can't be distracted. And I don't want to sit there necessarily and, and try to watch a video with my family around. They're not interested in it. There's a lot of distractions. And so with the rule book, I can kind of just learn at my own pace, if that makes sense. Uh, but I agree with CR Poll. Rule books are not always great, uh, but there's a lot of reasons for that. Now, some are very redundant. I've, I've read some rule books for, uh, and um, Uki Bakoya, the makers of Aqua Garden and Ostia, I've, I've, uh, this seems to be their thing, and probably because of that language barrier. But you know, they'll have a whole page of just text that tells you all this stuff, but it tells you like over and over and over again, you do this and you do this. And to be clear, you, you have to do this before you do that. And the only way that you do that is after you've done this. And it's like, well, yeah, I got it. I got it the first time. Why are you telling me this three different times? Uh, I can appreciate being thorough, but you also sit down to this rule book and you realize it's three times longer than it needs to be. And so I've got a lot of reading to do that I probably don't need to do. We could be playing this game much quicker. Uh, also, some books, and I'm actually working on one of these right now for a Kickstarter uh, video that I have to start putting together as soon as my vacation's over. They don't do a good job of summarizing. So I'm reading a rule book right now, and I, I won't I won't name it because I don't want to throw any shade. But they say, okay, well, on your turn, you do these three phases. And, and it says, here's phase one, and it's like a page and a half. And then here's phase two, and it's like four or five pages to the point that by the time you get to the end of that, you forget that you're in a phase of a turn. And so the next page starts with the third phase. And I just thought it was more actions that were part of the second phase. And so I've had to flip this thing back and forth dozens of times to try and understand sort of the summary and then expand it out into the details, which is how I like to teach a game. I say, okay, on your turn, you're going to do six things. This, 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 this. Now let's talk about the first thing. The first thing is this. The second thing is this. This is the third thing. Here's the fourth thing. Maybe the fourth one is a really long one. Okay, you know what? If it's a whole bunch of stuff, I'll come back to that. Here's the fifth thing. Here's the sixth thing. We got it. We understand it. Okay, now here's the fourth bit of it. Let me go into all the details on the actions. So that's one thing that, uh, you know, that I struggle with with those rule books. And I'll also say that, um, as I think I mentioned in the previous video, I do a lot of Kickstarter stuff. I do a lot of, you know, crowdfunding preview videos. And so I get rule books. Sometimes I don't even get a book. I get like a PDF online and I'm sitting there trying to read it on my tablet or something. I'll usually try to print those out to make them a little easier. Same thing. So I can just sit and go through them at my own pace, uh, you know, a little more comfortably than just hunched in front of a computer screen. But I've gotten some that aren't rule books. They're just an index of actions. Here's what this symbol means. Here's what this symbol means, uh, you know, turn structure, do this, do this, do that. They're not sentences, right? They're just kind of like little fragments. They're little segments of text. And you're trying to then piece this together into a coherent way of playing a game. And sometimes it's really difficult. So I can certainly appreciate the challenge that people have with rule books. And I'll tell you this real quick, last bit of this uh, section is that I, I did a job with the government many years ago, the U.S. government, uh, and I was working on a, a fairly big project, not really that big of a project, but for the government, everyone's, everything's kind of a big project. And I sat immediately next to two technical writers. My office was right next to two other offices for technical writers. And, and I, at one point, I got to know these folks fairly well because I sat next to them. And I was like, what is, what is a technical writer? And they basically explained, and I only came to understand this within the past couple of years was that their job was to write manuals, instruction documents on how to do stuff. And you realize very quickly, especially when it comes to computers, this was an IT related project, was that you get a lot of people who use computers every single day and they have no idea how to work a computer. They have no idea 
what some very very simple functions, commands, uh, you know, programs, whatever, and, and, and how to work with a computer. And so, CR Poll, you mentioned, you know, you're not con you're not maybe up to speed with some various commonly used vernacular. I get it because it's the same thing. You get people who use computers every single day and they still don't know how to use them. Uh, and so you tell them to, you know, run a syntax and they go, I don't, I don't even know what that means. I don't even know how to say that word, you know? Uh, and so I really came, especially recently, I have come to really understand the challenge that those two people face trying to take a complex set of instructions and reword it for the, the common Joe to be able to understand what they needed to do when this new system rolled out to them uh, it was it was really interesting and I almost kind of wish that I could have learned a little bit more from them back then because I think it would probably help me even when it comes to teaching games today anyways that was the question of the week thanks again everyone for participating uh, oh and I did mention this uh, I, I do jump to videos especially if I'm gonna be playing a game that I don't have if I know that we're getting together to play a game and I'll be talking about this in just a moment I will then turn to some videos out there and like others, I'm a big fan of Rodney Smith, the Watch Played series. I also really like Knights Around a Table. Uh, that's a that's a decent sized channel out there. Actually, the guy has quite a decent following, and he's very entertaining. He's funny, uh, and I can really appreciate that when I'm trying to learn the game because those jokes kind of make things stick a little better in my head, at least. I also like watching Nithrania. He's a little difficult to understand, but his rules are very clear and concise. A little bit of redundancy, but not not enough to be a problem. Uh, and he just just gets through the rules. And you know, I've spent a lot of time watching channels like Heavy Cardboard, Gaming Rules, and and some others and I feel like so much of them now, so much of their content is geared towards their uh, Patreon backers or their Kickstarter backers, you know, the people who are basically paying them some money. And I can appreciate that, but I need to learn the rules for a game. And I don't have three and a half hours to do it, especially when the first half hour is you talking to all your friends online and, and welcoming folks that, you know, you've been chatting with online for years. You know, if, if all this show was, was me just interacting with people in the comments, you're not going to attract new people. And, and, you're, and if you're there for a point, you're not getting it across. And so I kind of like these channels that just get right the rules. I totally respect if you have a segment like this, right, where you can just talk to people and, and joke around and have fun. But if I'm there to watch a video on how to play a game, I want to learn how to play the game. I don't need all the fluff. Anyways, that was the question for this week. Here's a question for next week. Now, real quick, as I mentioned, there might be some stuff going on next week. So I want to keep this one short and sweet. So the question for next week is tell me what your preferred player count is. How many people do you prefer to play games with? And then maybe possibly how many people you commonly get to play with. So maybe you prefer to play at four players, but some person's always unavailable. So you usually end up playing three. Or maybe like me, I prefer to play in slightly larger groups, but I mostly play two-player games. I know. Spoiler alert. Oh, well, I guess I gave mine away already. That is the question for next week. Let's get to some games played recently. All right, let's wrap up the weekly ratchet by talking about some recently played games. But real quick, I'm just going to mention that today is April 21st. It is a Sunday. And if I'm lucky, this video will go up on April 22nd. However, at the moment that my lips are moving, I don't actually have a way to get the data off of that camera onto this computer. So I'm going to have to run some errands tomorrow and see if I can't sort that out here in the woods. Uh, I think I'll be able to, but just cross your fingers that hopefully you'll get to see this before you know that you should crush it. Well, you know what? Hey, anyways, moving on. Let's talk about some games that I played. The first one is Nucleum. This is by Board and Dice, uh, and I do not have this game. So uh, a friend of mine brought this over last week. Daniel joined us as well. I got in a three-player game of Nucleum. I'm not going to go super heavy into this. It is a fairly heavy game, and it's very similar in nature to the game of Brass Birmingham. Now, I'll just say off the top of this, I'm not a fan of Brass Birmingham. It's just a very dry, boring game and I don't like the way that your actions are sort of dictated by these cards that you're randomly dealt you know at the beginning of each round and you have to try and make something out of these things uh, with everything taking so long to put into place while there is some mitigation to those cards it often takes too long to work around what you don't have 
what you need and what you don't have before then someone else just jumps on it anyways and then you're left with absolutely nothing and so I just don't care for Brass Birmingham and I was both pleased and displeased at the way that this game handled some of those Brass Birmingham elements so that's very similar in the fact that you have these different cities and you're trying to network train tracks between these different cities so you can move fuel either coal or in this case uranium to nuclear power plants to then be able to power up various buildings within these cities and so there's that same networking kind of a thing that brass birmingham has and that you have to have tracks established to where you're trying to get the power you then have to either purchase or provide the power from other sources to get through that network to those buildings um, this game tries to dance around it a little bit and then you can have multiple networks and as long as you have a train track touching a city even if it's just a train track to nothing you can then build in that city uh, which was just weird and it still doesn't really help you because you still have to move the fuel through the network and it has to be your network so it doesn't even have the sort of brass birmingham elements where you can use other people's elements but maybe providing a little extra you know benefit to them for doing so uh, so it was a little bit more flexible but not flexible in a way that really felt meaningful to me it didn't really feel like it fixed some of that randomness of brass birmingham and it also had these elements where you can only build certain types of buildings in certain cities and so if you don't have a network to it well like i said you could possibly still get over there and build it but if you need to then power it well, then you need a ton of effort to get connected to that part of of the board for your network and it's often just counterproductive to do so uh, there's also this achievement track on the side of the board and it has these these starred positions with numbers in them it looks like a score track but it's not a score track what it actually is is you sort of collect these star resources and then at certain times of the game you spend all of your stars to put a star token on that track except that it's divided up into five or six different segments you can only have one star in each segment so i had an achievement at the beginning of the game to get stars on the board on positions equal to or greater than the number of 10. Well, there were only three segments at 10 or higher. And so I had to get a star in each of those three segments to trigger that in-game scoring. And I did not realize, or at least I didn't remember. I knew that you could only put a star in each section, but I just forgot about it. You know, it's a new game. It's a new teach. There's so much going on. You're trying to understand. It's a fairly heavy game. And I forgot that I couldn't just put, you know, stars over there anywhere that I wanted. And so I had a star at maybe 11 and I was going to place a star on 16, except they were in the same segment. It was 14. And some, you know, Daniel reminded me, oh, yeah, yeah, you can't put it there. You have to drop it all the way down to nine. I was like, well, I don't want a nine. It's, it's got to be above 10 for this thing I'm trying to do that I wasn't obviously looking to advertise. And so I had to stop. I had to, like, well, hang on. I got to wait. I'm going to do something else, try and get two more stars. Then I can jump to the 16. Well, the next position was 28, if I recall. And so I then put all this effort into trying to get 28 more stars so I can put, you know, put a token up into that last space. And I just couldn't do it. I was actually one dollar shy at the end of the game from being able to pull it off. And I, I don't know. I, that's when I, I kind of tend to really like those games that say, hey, you know what? If you really need to, you can spend a victory point to get a, a, you know, a single resource or something. There are some games that do that. And I really wished at that moment that Nucleum was one of those games. So I didn't dislike it. But just all of, this, all of its systems didn't really jive. Again, there's some of that complexity, just for the sake of complexity. It was a neat game. I would probably try it again. I think that with that benefit of a little better understanding of the rules, I could do better with it. But anyways, that was Nucleum by Board and Dice. That was all that I got to play at home over the past week. Uh, the next game that we played here at the cabin just yesterday was Trekking the World. Uh, so real quick, I did a video here in the channel just last week. You may have seen it about family games. Uh, that video is doing very, very well. I'm really excited with the response to that. And it was actually a response to a question from our very own simulation, Chris. This is one of the games that we mentioned. And in that video, my daughter and I both mentioned and agreed that we hadn't played this in a while and we should probably check it out. And of course, when I brought it, I said, hey, let's play it. I got the... Do I have to? <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, are you serious? You just told our audience that you wanted to play this game again and apparently maybe you didn't really mean it i don't know but hey I, you know, I, I pulled the line from that video and i said you know what we're just gonna sit and play this game put down your switch and let's play this game and she beat me by a point 
she beat me by a point. She was so ecstatic when, when the dust settled and she had won by a single point and legitimately too. I mean, she played very, very well. She had a ton of end game scoring. This is a kind of a worker movement game. You're trying to move a single pawn uh, across all the various different countries and continents, whatever of the world. You're collecting some uh, little cubes that go into a set collection element. And then you're also collecting these cards along the way. Now they, they're multi-use cards. Aha, here we go with some multi-use cards. These cards can be used to move your pawn around the board, but then you'll also spend the cards to get various, uh, to, to go on tour. And you'll you'll tour these locations with these beautifully illustrated and very well narrated. These cards have kind of like an explanation of what each of these monuments and these special things are from all these different countries, all these different locations across the globe. Uh, and you're spending the cards to then get these cards, and they of course provide some end game scoring as well. It's a very simple game. In fact, we hadn't played it in a while and I was able to relearn it in just mere minutes. Uh, and I, I did enjoy it. And I'm certainly glad that my daughter won this one fair and square trekking the world. The last game on this list that I'll talk about real quick. And you're gonna notice I'm only bringing the box lid into play here because the game is set up right over here at the other end of this table. This is Brook City. This is by the Sadler Brothers and Blacklist Games. This one's actually out of print. I did not realize this. Uh, this is a cooperative game. It is a it's a, it's it's card based in that you have uh, each player represents a police officer and they have their own specific deck think of like marvel champions kind of have your own deck of cards that you're working through there's also a case deck and then a criminal deck the criminal deck works towards making the players lose the case deck is what the players have to solve to win the game now i played this last night two-handed solo uh and i actually had a really great time with it what i really liked with this was that uh while I think of some card games uh, like uh, I think I mentioned Marvel Champions already and some other and I can't think of any off the top of my head uh, you know like Star Realms games that, that you know are sort of built around a deck of cards and there's a lot of interaction between those cards which is great this one's also really nice because it has a big board it has these miniatures all over the place you can actually hop in little cars and zip around it almost feels like Grand Theft Auto except for you're the good guys on on the tabletop and I like that it's a cooperative game I think it was maybe a little too much for me to wrap my head around as a solo player. I would actually probably really enjoy this multiplayer, you know, cooperative, but I really enjoyed it. I had a pretty good time with it. And the reason it's still set up is because I think as soon as I'm done here, I'm going to play it again. That was Brook City. And that was Weekly Ratchet episode number 12. And like I said, I really hope that you're going to get to see this this week. Thank you so much for tuning in. Thanks for being a fan of the channel. I am always glad to interact with all of you and see you all here. I'm on vacation for the rest of this week, so you're probably not going to see anything else from me. I do intend on doing some other filming while I'm here, maybe working on some Dice Tower stuff. But other than that, I'm going to have some fun. So I will catch you next week. I hope you all have a fantastic time. See you soon. Cheers.